You know that old saying, the king is dead, long live the king? Yeah. It feels like that's just the dizzying, constant rhythm of frontier AI right now. Absolutely. A new model lands, the yeah. rankings all get rewritten. And the entire professional landscape just shifts beneath our feet. Today, we're going to be looking at the source material around the newest arrival that has uh, decisively reset the board. Google's Gemini 3. Which just debuted in November 2025. Exactly. And we're specifically looking at the analysis backing this launch. It's all powered by these fresh frontier benchmark wins and, and this fascinating new capability they're calling deep think mode. Google is not being subtle here at all. They're basically saying this is the new ceiling for intelligence. So our mission today, for you listening, is to really cut through the marketing hype. Right. And focus completely on the concrete numbers, the quantitative benchmark data. We need to understand precisely where this model establishes a new level of intelligent behavior, especially when we stack it against, you know, the heavyweights. The ones we all know. Yeah. GPT 5.1 and Quonsonnet 4.5. And the most immediate headline figure, it really signals the shift. The standard system configuration enters the El Marino leaderboard with an ELO score of 1501. And for context, that 1500 mark is a huge psychological barrier. It really is. It often means you're moving past a high human expert baseline. It suggests that if you care about getting real complex work done, not just casual chat. The default choice for your AI assistant might be changing. So let's start right there with the architectural breakthroughs. What exactly is DeepThink mode and why did Google even feel they needed to build this? Well, to get DeepThink, you first have to look at Gemini 3.0 Pro, which is the model's main uh, workhorse configuration. Okay. This whole generation is built around three core dimensions. Vastly improved reasoning, hugely expanded context, and true native multimodality. DeepThink is the experimental layer that just pushes that reasoning dimension to the absolute extreme. Wait, so this isn't just about faster chips or more transistors. It sounds like Google is architecting patients into the system. That's a real conceptual shift. That's a perfect way to put it. DeepThink is what happens when you let the model take its time. The normal mode, it prioritizes speed, right? A quick response. Of course. But DeepThink explicitly allocates more internal computation steps. It actually explores multiple potential solutions at the same time, weighs the alternatives, and, this is the crucial part, it checks its own work before it gives you the final response. So you're paying a little extra in compute time for a lot more accuracy. Exactly. So the practical interpretation here is, I mean, this is for the kind of problem where you normally grab a whiteboard. Right? The stuff you'd spend an hour wrestling with. Hard math proofs, maybe mm. some really tricky algorithm design. Physics riddles, or, you know, trying to unpack a super dense research paper. It's explicitly targeting what researchers call system two thinking. That slow, deliberate, analytical kind of thought. And we can actually quantify the impact of that deliberate pause. Deep think mode pushes the accuracy on these critical reasoning benchmarks way up. Okay, give me an example. If we look at humanity's last exam, which measures raw reasoning and knowledge without any external tools, the score jumped to around 41% accuracy. 41%. And what about on more specialized knowledge? So now compare that to GPQA Diamond. This is basically a PhD level scientific knowledge test. All right. Really complex multi-step questions. Right. Deep Think pushed that score to roughly 93.8%. Wow. Yeah. And the gap between those two scores shows that when it's given time, the model can apply its knowledge with near perfect reliability on these multi-step technical problems. And what about genuine abstraction? We hear about AGI benchmarks all the time. That brings us to ARC AGI2. It's a benchmark specifically designed to test for real abstract reasoning, not just pattern matching. So it's harder to game. Exactly. With deep think and code execution enabled, it crossed the 45% accuracy threshold. And that is a huge psychological barrier for the whole research community. So for you, the user, the conclusion is clear. If your work involves proofs or financial modeling or anything that needs non-trivial planning. This is the switch you just leave on by default. You wait the extra seconds, but what you're getting back is a vastly superior self-corrected result. Okay, the conceptual claims are huge, but the proof is always in the numbers. Let's get to the charts that probably have the competition doing a double take the Battle of the Titans comparison. This is where we stack the standard Gemini 3 Pro against its rivals. And the story gets really clear in the logic heavy tasks, right? It's an almost absurd lead on very hard problems. Take Mathrena Apex. This benchmark measures performance on extremely challenging math problems. Okay. Gemini 3 Pro achieved 23.4% accuracy. That sounds high for a test like that. 
What were the closest rivals doing on that same test? This is where the gap becomes so critical. GPT 5.1 hit only 1.0%. 1%? 1%. And Claudson at 4.5 managed 1.6%. The sources suggest this isn't just better training data, it's the model's architecture. It can verify its own solutions where the rivals just fail on the early steps. So it's a 20-fold margin. That's, yeah. that's the architectural gap right there. It is. And that pattern continues in general academic reasoning. On Humanity's last exam, G3 Pro scored 37.5%. Which is significantly ahead of GPT 5.1's 26.5%. And way ahead of Claude's 13.7%. And for visual reasoning, on ARC AGI2, the standard G3 Pro scored 31.1%. That dwarfs its own predecessor, Gemini 2.5 Pro, and still easily beats GPT 5.1's 17.6%. For raw logical horsepower, the story is just, it's clear, there is a new baseline. So we've established it can think better. Now the real question is, can it do better? Let's move from proofs and riddles to what matters most to developers code execution and agents. Right. If we look at competitive coding skills measured by Lab Code Bench Pro, G3 Pro got an impressive ELO of 2439. And for agents that have to operate in a live terminal, there's Terminal Bench 2.0. G3 Pro leads there too with 54.2% accuracy. This all feeds directly into this new development idea that the sources are calling vibe coding. Tell us what that is. And vibe coding is the idea that natural language completely replaces syntax as your main interface. So you just describe the outcome you want, the vibe. Exactly, the vibe and any constraints you have. Yeah. The agent then takes over, it breaks down the work, writes the code, calls tools, and reports back. It really feels like you're working with a tireless, very skilled junior colleague. And this is tied into Google Anti-Gravity, their agentic IDE. Yes, where the assistant has direct access to your editor, your terminal, your browser. Your job shifts from typing code to just supervising the plan and reviewing the changes. And they have a score for that too, right? I do. The Web Dev Arena score is 1487 ELO, and that's for generating complete full stack applications from just a single high level prompt. That level of agency needs really robust perception. So let's talk about the leap in multimodality. This is way beyond just captioning a picture, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. G3 now leads on complex image reasoning, that's MMMU Pro. Mm -hmm. And critically, it excels at reading desktop and mobile screens, that's ScreenSpot Pro. But the real breakthrough seems to be with video. Yes, video MMMU. This benchmark shows it tracking rapid actions and more importantly, maintaining context across hours of footage. Wait, when you say it tracks context for hours, that's a whole new class of utility. What's a practical scenario for that? It means you could upload, say, three hours of footage of a complex surgery and ask, where exactly did I make a mistake 45 minutes and 12 seconds in? And it would know. It maintains that long-term memory. For a developer, it means you can upload a screenshot of a broken UI and just ask for the code fix. Or you drag in your hand-drawn napkin sketches and the model turns them into production-grade code. And what about that visual computer demo? That seemed pretty incredible. That was the most compelling part. Yeah. The user just draws these rough red crosses over file icons on a desktop screenshot. Yeah. And the model correctly interprets that visual mark as a delete command. It actually executes it. It's seeing, understanding your intent, and then acting on it. That is an infrastructure level change. Okay, let's get practical. For anyone looking to build with this, how much does all this power cost and how do we get access? So the pricing is aggressively competitive. For the Gemini 3 Pro Preview, which has a huge 200,000 token context window, the input cost is $2 per million tokens. Then output. $12 per million. Even the super high context, 1 million token window, is priced to compete with rivals' standard models. That's vital info. And what about for our listeners who just want to experiment without a big commitment? This is crucial. For those of you wanting to prototype and test, there's a free rate-limited tier available right in Google AI Studio. So you can kick the tires without pulling out a credit card. Exactly. Okay, let's move past the press releases. What are the early users saying? On hacker forums, on Reddit, does the real-world performance actually line up with these incredible benchmarks? It absolutely does. The consensus is strong, and it aligns perfectly with the data. Right. One user on a private test suite, he just said, for logic, this thing killed every other model in the room. I mean, totally nuked them. So for problem-solving engineering, it feels like the new baseline. Genuinely, yes. But what's the acknowledged weak spot? There's always one. We have to apply some critical pressure here. The weak spot is pretty clearly creative output. A lot of fiction writers or people looking for highly stylized prose, they still prefer GPT 5.1 or Claude. How do they describe it? 
Gemini 3's creative output is sometimes described as highly competent or editorial, but not necessarily having that unique or magical voice. I see. But again, for the mission-critical cognitive work, the logic, the code, the planning, the path is pretty compelling. So what does this all mean for your workflow? I, I think the key takeaway is that Gemini 3 is now the reference point. We're looking yeah. at a new standard for deep reasoning, for long horizon planning, agentic coding. And for serious, practical, multimodal understanding that operates across your screen in your video. So to sum it all up. The final competitive summary is this. While GBT 5.1 and Claude might still win some of those niche creative battles, the benchmark evidence suggests Google has pulled way ahead where the pure, logical, mission-critical work gets done. So the combination of the benchmark lead, deep think, and that aggressive pricing. It's a powerful mix. It turns this system into something that feels closer to essential infrastructure for anyone who's building things. And the crown will absolutely move again. That is guaranteed in this field. But right now, if you need to ship faster, break fewer things, and offload your heaviest cognitive tasks. The evidence for your next tool choice is pretty clear. Give this model a real problem and let it think. A perfect place to leave it. And here's a final thought to reflect on. If deep think mode proves that intentionally allocating extra seconds for careful reasoning translates into exponential gains for an AI, what does that imply for your own human planning processes? Think about intentionally giving yourself a deep think mode, a set time to pause, to verify and consider alternatives before acting on a really critical decision.